good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever our viewers uh, may happen to be. We're delighted to have three very, very distinguished uh, participants in today's conversation about Biden administration policy toward uh, Ukraine uh, and toward the war in Ukraine. Uh, I'll just begin by thanking the Carnegie Corporation for its support for the Monterey Conversations. And we have upcoming Monterey Conversations with uh, Stephen Kotkin, uh, and uh, Corey Shockey and Ali Wen, uh, and quite a few others in, in uh, November uh, and December. So please stay tuned uh, for those. And let me now, uh, with brevity, introduce our three speakers. I could go on uh, for a very long time about their accomplishments and publications, but we'll just mention their institutional uh, affiliations and then pass the baton uh, to them for the conversation. Moderating, today, moderating today's conversation, uh, is Kadri Leek of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, and then we have Andrea Kendall-Taylor of the Center for New American Security and Michael Kaufman of the Center for uh, Naval Analysis. And we're just delighted to have three uh, of the leading voices uh, on all of these questions with us today for the conversation. So <laughs> with that, I pass the baton to you, Kadri, and, and, and also to the three of you. Thanks so much for participating. Thank you very much, Michael, and many thanks for uh, inviting me, for inviting a European to moderate a discussion about U.S. policy on, on Russia. I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased. And thanks also to Carnegie Corporation uh, for supporting the event and the Monterey Conversations uh, series. Much appreciated. So, uh, yeah. Where to start? How would you, Andrea and Michael, how would you characterize uh, President Biden's policy on, on Russia and Ukraine? I mean, I'm currently working on European views on, on Ukraine. We conducted uh, some interviews with European policymakers and experts in all member states over the summer to try to see where different European Union member states stand on the question of war and what next. And it's evident that Europeans definitely don't have a clear understanding of how this war would, would end. They predict a long stalemate, um, lots of doom and gloom, everything will depend on events. So where does the US administration stand or what is sort of Biden's theory of, of victory, if, if any, or, or where is he trying to uh, steer the Western alliance? Because, and I think we will later get to that as well, US is quite clearly that is the country that is playing a leadership role right now also for, for Europeans. So where, where are we headed and how will we get there? Andrea, will you kick us off? Sure. I think um, kind of in one word, I would describe the policy as evolving. Um, I think from the very beginning, it's clear that they were going to support Ukraine, but the level of support has grown the better Ukraine has done on the battlefield. I think if we remember back to the earliest days of the conflict, right, we overestimated um, Russian capabilities um, and I, you know, we, the, there were a lot of things the intelligence community got right. The fact of warning about the conflict that it would happen, that Putin would uh, would uh, invade, was something that the intelligence community and the Biden administration got right. Um, we did, however, overestimate Russia's uh, capabilities on the battlefield, and I think that had real policy implications that shaped our willingness. Uh, to provide uh, the support that Ukraine needed early on in the conflict. So I think from the beginning and out of the gates, there was a very kind of tentative, cautious approach where the emphasis certainly was on avoiding a direct military confrontation with Russia. That has persisted throughout this. That has been one of the things that has been extremely co uh, constant throughout. Um, but I, but you know, I think I've heard. I don't know whose words these were, but I think the Biden administration has used the term, you know, that they've boiled the frog um, in the water, right? That they've gradually ratcheted up the support that they have been willing to provide, um, and in doing so, have uh, 
and they're, I think, in their view, have avoided eliciting uh, extreme backlash from the Kremlin. So again, I think it's this, it's, it's, so it's evolving. Um, it, it is guided by the desire to avoid the direct military conflict with Russia. Um, but it is persistent and it is lasting. And again, we have heard President Biden in the last couple of days, including after the really horrific attacks on all the Ukrainian cities after the Kerch Strait Bridge incident, um, President Biden has clearly articulated that the United States is in this for as long as it takes. So I do think it is persistent. Um, but I do think we're all kind of stuck in this place where we don't have a clear theory of victory. The Biden administration has been extremely cautious to not articulate its own uh, theory of victory for fear of kind of diverging or getting out in front of you, of, of Kiev on that. Um, and so I think we're all kind of stuck in this area where I don't think any of us has a very clear sense of victory other than I think I would say, especially in the wake of the counteroffensive, my sense is that there is a greater belief in Ukraine's ability to push Russian, Russia out of large swaths of territory. So I think more and more, my sense is that people, the theory of victory, they may see as playing out on the battlefield. Um, that of course brings with it uh, the risk of escalation. And that's something that we've all been talking quite a lot about. We can come back to that. But I know that's kind of a rambling answer to say, I think it's evolving. I think it's been guided from the beginning by the desire to avoid the direct conflict uh, with Russia. Um, and that it is it is steadfast and it will be enduring. Thank you. Uh, well, Michael, we were together with you in Helsinki um, just a week ago, or was it 10 days, where you said that Russia is currently on path to losing that war. So um, how do we get there so that we will survive Russia's loss, that it doesn't become too dangerous for, for, for everyone else. And what would that loss look like? Yeah, well, okay, that's just a, an assessment of the current situation in the war, right? Ukraine is winning, you know, it very much has the initiative and has the momentum behind its offensive operations, certainly going into the winter. And the Russian military is in a very vulnerable position right now. I think objectively, Russia is losing the war. Okay, that being said, I think a lot of people often overinterpret the, the sense of losing to the war has already been won. And here I always urge caution, right, with straight line analysis. Uh, wars often, you know, they don't end the way they begin, and they typically tend to go on longer than most people hope or expect. It's just a tendency I often see in discourse, right? So what does Russia losing the war mean? Well, it depends. I mean, to me, a more interesting question is how you balance Russia losing the war with the question, what does victory mean for Ukraine, too? Uh, for Russia, I think the war already, in many respects, appears to be a strategic defeat, although some people debate that. Uh, the big question is, and I think that's what you're alluding to, is how do we you know, so-called survive Russia losing the war? Well, right now, at least in the interim, Russian political leadership has moved forward with mobilization. Right? Mobilization has been an incredibly fitful and messy process but it introduces considerable uncertainty into the trajectory of the war. That is, it could extend the war considerably, or it could not, right? This remains to be seen. As long as Russian political leadership believes that mobilization gives it options or some capacity to stabilize the front lines and perhaps over time regenerate military power, I actually think that the, that the risk of escalation is quite low. However, in the long term, there is a significant challenge, which is by virtue of enacting wartime measures and formally annexing Ukrainian territory, I think that uh, Putin very much has committed the regime or staked the regime on this war and has in many ways severed his options to revise minimal war aims. Usually when you're thinking about war termination, right, beyond just sort of battlefield victory, you're thinking about one side eventually being forced by, by the military situation to politically revise their war aims, you know, if not outright concede defeat, um, at the very least, dramatically revise whatever the minimal war aims is that they have. Okay, so you know, it's clear that Russian political leadership has, in many ways, burned their bridge in this regard, and that means that the likelihood of escalation down the line, more in the medium long term, has grown. 
And I don't say that to overly concern people. I still think that the like the sort of the risk of nuclear escalation is rather low, but certainly the highest it has been at least since 1983, right? Abel Archer. I think that's a fair uh, historical reference point. I'm happy to talk a bit more about that. Just I think to me it's a nuanced topic. It's come up quite a bit in the last two weeks. Uh, I'd also say that I think Russia retains escalation options between where we are now currently in the war and nuclear use. That's very much been evidenced by the wave of Russian missile strikes against Ukrainian cities in the last couple of days. These options don't have much efficacy, meaning bombardment has very little course of effect. And if anything, it typically just builds resolve, right? But I think if anything, it just increases Ukrainian resolve. And Russia actually doesn't have much in the way of military capacity left to dramatically endanger Ukrainian cities. A lot of those capabilities have already been spent over the course of this war. But put that aside for the moment, there are a host of escalation options that Russia has vis-a-vis -vis Western countries that are supporting Ukraine that have yet to take place. I think many have kind of breathed a sigh of relief in believing that these things haven't barked. You know, industrial sabotage, infrastructure attacks, cyber warfare, things that are being done, could be done against satellites and what have you, right? But the thing you need to appreciate is just because they haven't happened yet doesn't mean that they cannot happen in the future, or that Russia now lacks somehow the capability to enact them. Those things might be yet to come. They're just a cautionary note, right? And, and to some extent, there's some anecdotal evidence that now that Russian political leadership has fully committed to the war, they might be beginning to be willing to follow through with some of these more risk-taking actions. I'm just saying, as always, so that, so that you know, my job as an analyst is to be a bit more on the conservative side, right? To consider kind of the risks and more of the worst case scenarios and to just make sure that folks don't become complacent. Right, thanks very much. We, we, will, we will try to avoid that. Um, I will want you to talk, tell us more about uh, nuclear escalation, but before we get there, uh, maybe to continue a little bit with Biden and 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 messaging uh, to Russia, preparing for that conversation, I reread Biden's New York Times article from I think late May, where he articulated U.S. policy vis-à-vis -vis Russia and uh, as concerns the war. I found it all very sensible. He explained very clearly why the U.S. is supporting Ukraine, that it is a priority at the same time to avoid a conflict with Russia directly, that the U.S. is not trying to uh, start a regime change in, in Russia, and, and the U.S. is not trying to um, uh, bring down Putin. Um, all in a very simple, very clear language uh, I think it was a really good article, but the events of recent weeks have, have made me think that maybe there might be soon time um, for a new message. The new, it, it might be that we need to articulate again um, our relationship towards Russia, even if Putin has put himself in a position where it is hard to find a way out for him. And Michael, you said already that Putin has staked so much of a regime on the outcome of the war, uh, but it becomes objectively harder and harder to see how he can actually leave it and survive as a politician. I mean, one way or other, it, it's going to be very hard for him. And he, of course, tries to present it as, as Western crusade against Russia. His full 34th September speech was very much about that, one of the most furious tirades against the West that I have seen from him. Uh, partly it might be for political purposes, uh, partly I think he actually thinks it. And I, I can see some of it stuff entering Russian conversations in ways it wasn't the case before. I mean, Russia's foreign policy debate, I mean, censored as it is, and you need to read between the lines, but when the war started, people were really shocked about it and felt really, really bad about it. Now, more and more go along with a sort of Russia versus West line uh, in a more or, or less sophisticated way. Uh, 
uh, and they pick up those Western messages. I recently saw in one of the more sensible Russian Telegram channels, they linked an article to Washington Post that said that uh, we don't have a Putin problem, we have a Russia problem. So that makes me wonder, you know, what is that a time soon for someone in the West? And I am afraid that has to be President Biden um, to articulate a message that would say that Russia would still be there, even if if a war goes not Putin's way, and even if that affects Putin's own political fate. Andrea. I think it's a great question. Um, and I don't know if we're quite there yet. I mean, I get that your question is, are we moving in that direction and might we get there soon? I think where the administration is and where we should continue to be is that there's no change, there's no opening on the Russian side. We keep coming back to this part that any dialogue or discussions really take two sides who want to engage in that discussion. Um, and if anything, it is quite obvious that the Kremlin um, has not changed its war aims. Despite their setbacks on the battlefield, we still continue to see senior Russian officials talk about regime change, talking about the same maximalist objectives that they have in Ukraine. And so there really is no opening. And so it, to me, still feels like it's not the time. Um, I think the other kind of imperative that I'm sensing from the Biden administration is also kind of the resolve or the intent to demonstrate that the nuclear saber rattling is not effective, right? There is a, it is really critically important that we um, demonstrate that we are not backing down or moving away for things we would have otherwise done just because Putin continues to talk in very strong language about the, the risk of nuclear escalation. Um, so I think that's another key thing. And I, you know, there's a lot of stakes there. I mean, people talk about it, it, it and people who know these nuclear um, issues far better than I do, but highlighting the importance of not of, of demonstrating resolve. So if we do back down, there's that uh, logic, which I subscribe to, which would be, well, what would keep Putin from saying at some future time that parts of the Baltics or Warsaw, for that matter, would be part of Russian territory and therefore fall under Russia's nuclear umbrella? So if, if we give in here, what's to say it doesn't continue in the future? And certainly it sends a message to other nuclear powers that, that this is an effective strategy. So yeah, I, I think your point is really well taken. Um, and so I think we have to start thinking about because there, it, 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 I, I think the important thing is in my mind, there is more um, public discontent over the war now in the wake of mobilization than there was before, right? We know that this was a, a decision to mobilize was something that Putin has avoided doing for seven months because he knew it would be politically costly. We know that he has tried for months and months to convey a sense of normalcy to Russians inside uh, the country. Um, that there's nothing really to see here. And there was really interesting polling showing that more and more Russians were paying less attention to the war as time went on. Well, mobilization has changed all of that. Um, and so I think, Kadri, your point about I, it, it, we have to probably start thinking about how we can communicate those types of messages in order to try to, I think, I know, drive a wedge is not the right term, but separate Putin from the rest of Russia and I don't mean that that would encourage regime change and that's going to somehow embolden Russians to rise up and overthrow Putin. That's not the point. But it can at least, I think, create um, more pressure on the Kremlin or at least create the possibility that that we can uh, get back to a more stable relationship sometime in the future after Putin is not there. So even if it doesn't have an immediate impact I think those types of messages at some point in the near future could be prudent if we're thinking long term. At some point, we are going to want to stabilize relations with Russia sometime post Putin. And those types of messages, I think, are important for enabling us or creating a, a, the ground to be able to return to a more stable relationship somewhere down the future. So I guess bottom line is it, it may not be time yet but you can sense that something is shifting on the ground in Russia that perhaps would um, make those types of signals or statements prudent. Right, and I, I actually, I mean, myself, I also have a sense that post-Putin relationship between West and Russia would probably not be similar to the sort of relationship there was in the 1990s or I mean, the thing that um, 
not only that we wouldn't be so close and so friendly, but also I don't think there would be such expectation in the West that Russia would sort of try to fit into a Western system. But that is something I see fairly widespread in, in Russia, the assumption that if we lose, then the West will come back, impose uh, all its rules, norms and uh, ideas upon us, which I don't see at all. I mean, I, I, I think that lesson has uh, failed, has been learned. We, we tried, we failed, not only in Russia, and, and there is a sort of rethink happening. So, um, yeah, I would think that it, it might need to be communicated to Russians that, you know, you will, you will still be allowed to be a Russia and, and think unlike us. We, we don't expect you to, I don't know. Go back to 1990s. Michael, your thoughts on, on, on that? I mean, I'm unfortunately a little bit overly kind of tactically and operationally focused on what's happening in the war, given what I do professionally. I'd maybe make a couple points. First, on the management of the conflict itself, and it's along the lines of what um, Andrea said. I think that the administration's goal has been to attain a strategic defeat for Russia and not to push Ukraine for any kind of early negotiations or concessions, especially given that Ukraine is visibly winning. I think the goal has also been to let Ukraine in the meanwhile define victory. And I think there's a strong agreement on interim goals with Ukraine, which is at least retake territory to February 24 lines. The reason I'm saying this because earlier you asked me, what does defeat look like for Russia? Or what does victory look like for Ukraine? Ukrainians are pretty clear that the minimum goals they have are February 24th, but those are not the real objectives. I think at the very least, their objectives are to retake territory lost to 2014. And if there's one thing you can be confident of is that there's no return to status quo antebellum. There's the one, one uh, line that this war isn't going to end at is where it began on February 24th, because neither militarily nor politically doesn't make any sense the Ukrainian forces advance to this line and stop if they're sufficiently successful on the battlefield. So at the very least, while it's difficult to say how this war uh, will end, there's at least a few things we can say about how we're pretty sure it won't end, right? It will not end to going back to the way things began February 24th. Uh, the other objective, I think Andrea spoke to this very well too, is really about managing escalation and increasing military assistance while avoiding horizontal and vertical escalation of the conflict. That's worked largely pretty well so far, but it's required incremental increase. And a lot of people have questioned that, meaning they've questioned the balance of it and they've been unhappy with it. And that's fine. If you know, if there's one thing you're used to if you've ever served in government is that people who are outside of government sitting on their couch definitely think that they could do a better job managing a large conventional war in Europe than you might, right? So this is not unusual in that regard. And it's, it's worthwhile for folks to make uh, criticisms and offer outside opinions, I think. But in general, I actually think the administration has done a pretty good job on it. Um, where I might differ a bit is in kind of the overall discussion of nuclear weapons. So nuclear weapons have not deterred U.S. involvement or support for Ukraine. And I think on the whole, have the, the administration was able, working with Ukrainians, to achieve in many respects the kind of outcomes that you see now, right? Provision of equipment, training, ammunition, intelligence support. It's helped Ukrainians really shift the war in the military balance. But nuclear weapons have had considerable effects in terms of escalation management and war deterrence, right? Whether you think anybody in NATO intended to intervene or not, they certainly have a deterrent effect regarding direct intervention. They've, to some extent, shaped thinking on what kind of capabilities we're willing to provide Ukraine. And they've also shaped thinking about end use restrictions, that is, uh, essentially asking Ukraine not to use certain capabilities that have been provided against Russian territory, right? So they have to an extent shape policies. And if there's one thing Russians will walk away from, perhaps uh, in this conflict, is understanding that yes, nuclear weapons do have efficacy. They play a role in escalation management and in deterring uh, the other side from pursuing some of the options they might have considered. They might consider. And they're just to help kind of frame a bit the conversation on what nuclear weapons have or have not done for Russia. There's a great deal they haven't done, but certain things they have done. Um, but I'll, I'll leave it at that, because I think probably some other folks might want to follow up specifically on the nuclear issue. Kadri, yes. I actually just have one more thought on your question, because I do think it's such a good one. Um, 
if we're thinking about a long-term relationship with Russia, and if the goal over time is to get to something that's more stable, and we're talking about in the post-Putin era, those the types of statements and signals that you're talking about are important, but we obviously don't need to put all of our eggs in one basket, meaning we also have a lot of other tools that we can be using simultaneously. So we should talk about all of the sanctions and export controls and other um, kind of the ways that we're trying to constrict and constrain Russia's capabilities. Like we can do those things at the same time, right? As a gradual strategy. So we can send the signals to try to ensure that uh, Russian attitudes don't become a barrier to a more stable relationship in the future, while also making sure that we have those policies in place like the sanctions and export controls to ensure that Russia in the meantime can't sustain aggression beyond its borders. Like those two things can happen at the same time if we're thinking um, in the long term. So again, I just I, I think it's a good yeah. question and we just have to think about how we do it um, and uh, being mindful, like you said, that a lot of the kind of general contours of Russian foreign policy aren't going to disappear once Putin leaves. And so it is prudent that we're thinking about these other tools that we've got to, in order to constrict the Kremlin um, from acting out with aggression in the future. Uh, and so both of those things, I think, are, are necessary in order to move towards that more distant, more stable relationship. True. And at the same time, I mean, in addition, while Putin is still there, one needs to maintain some contact with him or his administration as well. I mean, the US, I think, clearly needs. In Europe, we, we debate it, whether the calls to the Kremlin are harmful or useful or harmless as well as useless. I mean, the latter camp. Uh, I think all European leaders can do by reaching out to Putin is maybe to sort of try to bring some facts to his desk that his subordinates will not give him. Um, that's thankful enough task. At the same time, it's unlikely to change his mind about his tactical options. Uh, but US is an entirely different story in the sense that United States is clearly what Putin considers the main adversary against whom he is up to in Ukraine. Um, and also any nuclear signaling or, or any anything like that should happen between Russia and the United States. Or also, I think, I mean, negotiated settlement. Everyone in the West has been quite clear that it's Ukraine's prerogative to decide how long they want to fight. And I don't think that is going to change. But at one point, should there be readiness in the Kremlin? Uh, yet again, I sense that some back channel between Washington and Moscow might, might come into, into play. In fact, there has been such talk couple of occasions, uh, I think I saw it resurrected recently. So how much do we know about? I mean, uh, are there any contacts? Is, 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 is something going on? I think there are some contacts between the military, but on political level, is anything of interest happening on, or not really? Not that I'm aware of, and I'm not sure exactly where the communications on the nuclear side of things are taking place, if it's military to military or if the White House, a la like Jake Sullivan and others, are communicating those messages. I'm not sure what the channels are. But in terms of those direct communications, I mean, just yesterday, President Biden gave the interview to CNN where the idea of meeting with Putin came up and he was quite clear. Um, well, he did he did have a caveat that if Putin approached him to talk about um, Griner's case, for example, he would be amenable to talk about that. But I think he was fairly clear that when it comes to the war in Ukraine, that he sees no reason to talk to Putin at this time. He highlighted the fact that he sees him as a war criminal. Um, and I, again, for all of the reasons that we said, it, I mean, there's clearly not very much to talk with um, uh, with with Putin at this point because there is absolutely no interest. Um, President Biden also repeated the mantra, which I guess we could put in, under the bin of what U.S. policy has been: nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. Um, and so I am skeptical that there would be much back channeling about the contours of an agreement. I think that is something that the Biden administration holds very deeply. 
Um, and so that would also kind of uh, advise against having that kind of back channel if they are actually talking about potential resolutions of the conflict. Your point, I bet, but what they are careful to do are these more military to military and trying to communicate um, how the United States would respond, particularly to nuclear use, right? Jake Sullivan has made clear that they communicated, as has Secretary Blinken, that they have sent those signals to the, to the Kremlin about kind of horrific or catastrophic consequences if Russia crosses the threshold into the nuclear domain. So they are trying to um, keep, I mean, and again, I think their preference, rightly so, is having these discussions out of the public light, right? It serves nobody's interest to be duking it out on nuclear issues in the public domain. Um, and so I think they are trying as hard as they can to try to keep those conversations um, behind closed doors um, and making those kind of direct, um, clear signals about how the United States would respond. So again, I think from the Biden administration's perspective at this point, there is absolutely no reason to talk to Vladimir Putin because it's clear he doesn't have anything that he is interested in talking about at this time. Also, Mike, Mike has also made the great point uh, repeatedly about any kind of pause in the conflict. Discussions about negotiations would just be used by the Russians to reconstitute forces, build up strength, and then renew again later. I think the, the White House understands that as well, as do the Ukrainians quite clearly. So there's not a lot of point in talking to, to, to Putin himself, but I do think the White House is seeking out these other levels of communication to try to keep the guardrails on, to avoid um, any mistakes, any unintended escalation, any miscommunication. Those channels, I think, are probably working a little bit, not as much as they should be, but I think um, there is at least effort to try to keep those lines open. Michael, I think it's it might be the time to to ask about escalations and and um, also also nuclear escalation. Um, could it happen? How could it happen? What can be done to make it not to happen? Okay, well, I think I only have the answers to some of that, to be perfectly honest. But on uh, could it happen? Yes, it could. And while I think the risk remains relatively low, when you're talking about nuclear escalation, even a low probability is still pretty significant, right? In some of the worst periods of the Cold War, uh, for example, the Ber Berlin crisis, people often assess that Khrushchev believed that the risk of war was only around 5% or less, but it was still seen as fairly significant, you know, so... That's important for folks from other professions will often ask, well, what does low probability versus high probability mean to you? And I would say 5% is a pretty significant probability on the risk of nuclear escalation when you're discussing something like that. All right. Uh, with that in mind, you know, I think that nuclear escalation is something that the Kremlin might choose to pursue down the line if mobilization fails, but only in extremists where there's a real collapse of cohesion of Russian forces. We've seen repeatedly in this war that significant battlefield defeats and operational defeats are not a cause for nuclear escalation. I hold to the opinion that the likelihood that this war ends one way or another without Russian nuclear use is much higher than the likelihood of Russian nuclear use in this war at least based on what history we know since the invention of nuclear weapons, nuclear powers have gotten themselves into wars and have lost them throughout 20th century and 21st century without resorting to nuclear weapons. I'm not saying that's necessarily what's going to happen here, right? I'm just saying that we have some history to look back to in assessing that nuclear use is not somehow predetermined or overdetermined as a potential outcome, right? But we're discussing the topic, I think, or at least thinking about it, uh, both in the analytical community and from what I've heard of government folks quite soberly as, as a potential as a potential uh, probability. Okay. It could take very many forms. You know, there's an entire gradient that, it, that you can envision from nuclear testing to nuclear demonstration outside of this theater to nuclear demonstration inside the theater to actual limited nuclear employment potentially against a military target in Ukraine or something of that nature. I think people need to separate in the conversation is nuclear escalation for the purposes of war termination, right? To get a strategic conversation going, to make a course of threat, 
perhaps when Russian forces are in dire straits and Putin is looking for an operational pause or some kind of negotiation versus nuclear use for war fighting, which is a very different category of employment. I see a lot of these conversations kind of get mixed up and intermingled with each other in not necessarily helpful ways. Nuclear use for war fighting, well, most Russian nuclear weapons are not so much battlefield nuclear weapons or even necessarily uh, tactical nuclear weapons, but they're often, the way they discuss them are non-strategic nuclear weapons, primarily weapons for theater nuclear employment, right? Which is to say that to hit military targets that are permanent or semi-permanent critical infrastructure and the like. Now, I've heard a set of debates in the last two weeks about what nuclear use could achieve for Russia on the battlefield. And to be very frank, I've learned a lot of things about nuclear weapons in the last two weeks that I don't think are necessarily true, okay? Which is to say, the, the short answer is it really depends. I would not hold to the belief that use of nuclear weapons in a very tactical sense, despite the fact that we'll have strategic political implications either way, right? The first nuclear weapon that gets used will have uh, strategic outcomes and effects on the course of this war, either way, whether it's high yield, low yield, medium yield, whether it's against an active military target or something else, people just need to appreciate that, right? will be the first nuclear weapon used in war, fundamentally since nuclear weapons were developed and used in World War II. But putting that aside, the battlefield effects can vary. And I don't want to get into them in this conversation, except to say it depends. I wouldn't be orally deterministic in assuming they can dramatically change the war. I also wouldn't hold to the belief that I've heard somewhat uttered in the last two weeks in some opinions that it doesn't really matter or doesn't make a difference. Yeah, it does. Nuclear weapons do matter and, and they can have real effects. Don't be really dismissive about them either. There is a reason why we work so hard to deter nuclear use. OK, trust me, there's a practical reason for it, too. Right? And it's not because they're just larger, uh, just larger versions of conventional weapons. So I hope that kind of paints the picture. All right. And what could be done to deter it? Well, that's the hardest question that you asked me, Kadri. Um, I would prefer to dodge that question, you know, from... From what I can tell of kind of Jake Sullivan's appearances on the news, it's clear that the administration is is trying uh, and is signaling and is communicating to Russians what might happen. And in public, they are trying to properly stay kind of vague and ambiguous about what threats they may or may not have made and what they may have messaged to the Ru Russian uh, leadership regarding U.S. course of action. And I think that's prudent and and for kind of fairly straightforward and obvious political reasons, right? So I'm not, I, I personally don't necessarily want to get into that conversation of what the U.S. should try to do to turn Russian nuclear use. Not Kadri, I'll jump in and Mike, this might even be a question back to you. Is, I mean, so you've talked about kind of reasons why you might use it on the battlefield, but I think your point that you made earlier before that Putin really has staked the regime on this war also raises the potential that Putin really could use a nuclear weapon if he saw it as um, protecting his own, I don't know, I, I would say survival, right? Um, and I, I, I come back a lot to there's um, that uh, political science research on uh, personalist authoritarian regimes. Like these are the ones that the, the, the leaders that have the worst post tenure fates. So most likely if you're a personalist authoritarian leader, you don't get to retire quietly like a democratic leader. Um, you're most likely killed or jailed or exiled or some some kind of poor, bad fate. And there's a lot of good research that shows then what you expect to happen to you later affects your decisions while you're in office. These are the guys who cling most violently to power because they believe probably that their own life um, is often on the line. So I would also say that's another potential down the line, and again, I agree with Mike, it's not eminent and he, Putin would likely try all sorts of things. There's ways they can escalate, like the attacks on the cities have shown. They can escalate in all sorts of different ways. Um, but so so that's the, the use that I actually worry about the most. Um, I feel like as if Putin, A, he would be uh, worried about his own survival, and he has kind of so conflated himself with the state that I think he could you know, look to use a nuclear weapon if he sees, you know, a, a quote unquote, a, a threat on on the Russian state. I mean, those two things, I think, in his mind are probably um, one in the same. So I worry about that, too. I also worry, and this maybe is where my question is for you, Mike, 
is about like if if you think there is growing influence among some of the hardliners within the Kremlin. So, you know, a lot has been made of these attacks over the weekend. Some people haven't interpreted it, I guess myself included, as evidence that these hardliner constituents are perhaps having greater influence over Putin's decision making. And I think these are the kind of people inside the Kremlin or in the kind of Russian um, domestic scene that I think their victory or their theory of winning is probably to terrorize Ukrainians, to inflict so much pain on on Ukrainian civilians that you compel them to back down. And so I wonder if those voices are ascendant, if Putin becomes more beholden to these more hawkish hardline factions, if again, that could shape decision-making about what the path to victory looks like and that it is terrorizing Ukrainians and that he he may, again, would wrongly calculate, because I think they that that is a gross misreading of Ukrainian society, but maybe that they, they, they don't understand that and then could be compelled to use a nuclear weapon if they see that as a plausible pathway to winning this conflict. Yeah. Michael, yeah, and to add that, I mean, uh, there is also lots of speculation of uh, how much impact on uh, war, war fighting tactics uh, to, does one or other general uh, have. I mean, right now they have appointed a new leader to the war effort who is notorious after his activities in Aleppo, and many people rush to say that it's him bombing the Ukrainian cities. That's exactly what he did in Syria. I'm not sure, you know, is it so straightforward? Is it not? We often hear that also that Putin himself uh, intervenes in sort of tactical battlefield decision making. Um, that does not sound good. Uh, that sounds actually pretty bad for Russia. Um, anyway, um, Michael, what do you make of, 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 of any of these? Okay. So I think to Andrea's comments, um, I think these are really good points. And that's why I always tell people, be cautious. Don't, we can't assume that he won't do something like that. Which remember, if you're listening to this conversation right now, the odds are very high that up until February 23rd, you were one of the many people that didn't think Russia would conduct a large scale invasion of Ukraine too, right? And I'm not saying everybody thought that, but most folks did. And for good reason, fine. So we should be careful based on that experience and also assuming that having escalated and have a committed to regime, Putin definitely wouldn't use nuclear weapons. We don't know, right? And, and I've been frank about that. Next, I've heard some hand waving as well in the last couple of weeks from people saying, well, maybe nuclear weapons won't work. Please don't think this way. That's both dangerous and profoundly unsound. And second, maybe people won't fall through with a criminal order to use nuclear weapons. Please also don't think this way. If the last two waves of attacks against Ukrainian cities hadn't convinced you that the Russian military will follow through with all sorts of orders to conduct strikes against civilian populations, I don't know what will, okay? So please believe that either people will fall through with it or if they don't, Putin will find somebody who will. Don't like make, these are what we call intellectual alibis, right? You just come up with reasons for why. You don't want, don't want to deal necessarily with the reality. Okay, uh, Kadri, with your question regarding general. So I think there's often a tendency in, in discourse to personify or personalize uh, these aspects of warfare. Uh, senior generals make absolutely no difference for tactics, to be honest. This is a pretty large battlefront with a lot of different forces involved. They don't necessarily affect the decision to conduct strikes across Ukraine either. This could well very likely was a political decision. Uh, the generals don't dramatically differ from one another and large conventional wars fundamentally come down to attrition, right? And so some generals are more competent, some generals are operationally more sound than others. But on the whole, they don't have these effects. So nothing really is going to change with the appointment of somebody like Surovikin. He was de facto in charge of most of the Russian forces in the war to begin with, prior to this. He's at least the third general that's been technically appointed to be in charge of the war, and dramatic differences have not been observed between them. Oh, they all served in, in Syria, by the way. And they all served in Syria during a time when they all engaged in these very same kind of tactics, and it's very hard to see any difference between them uh, along this front. So I think this is often a narrative that takes hold that has uh, a tenuous connection to reality. 
not expect much change. And by the way, Sorvikin's appointment is no favor to him. He's being appointed as the face of a failing enterprise. And it may it may seem a high honor, but in many respects, that's a poison chalice he's likely going to have to drink from. So uh, it's no service to him and his and his career ambitions since he was shortlisted <laughs> to become the next chief of general staff. Well, the Russian military is losing the war and changing the face of the war won't alter any of the structural reasons for why it's losing the war. Right. Thank you very much. Um, some um, sober assessments um, to bring down uh, heated speculations. Um, I have my next question, but before I ask it, uh, just a note to the audience. If you have questions, you can start thinking about them. Uh, please type them into the chat box where I will find them and, and ask the uh, uh, the speakers. Uh, we went to live questions here, but uh, that way we allow them. But meanwhile, I want to ask about midterm elections. How big a milestone will that be for US policy and Ukraine and, and Russia? What, what, could, what could feasibly change uh, in US actions, but also American-European relationship. Uh, I, I recently read an article by my colleague Jeremy Shapiro, who predicted that after midterms, uh, the US could become a lot more demanding when it comes to European uh, help to Ukraine, both military as well as uh, budgetary. Um, so how do you see it, Andrea? So this is not my strong point. I've actually spent uh, quite a uh, little time following the goings on of the US Congress, which is probably to my detriment. But um, I think it's really hard to know. I mean, I think we're still, um, there's a lot of uncertainty about which way the midterm elections are gonna go. Um, a lot of these races are gonna be extremely close. And so it's hard to say that, you know, it, I, it, it's not um, as clear as I think people had thought a while ago that we would see a wild swing back to the Republicans in midterms. I, st I still think there's a lot more question marks about just how much change we will see. Um, there have obviously been kind of more of the restrainers or the kind of, you know, um, uh, kind of ice, not, I don't want to say isolated, but a small contingent that has spoken out, you know, um, Green and others um, have uh, been, you know, very critical of U.S. support for Ukraine, for example. So there certainly are Republican voices who um, advocate that line. Um, but generally, when you look at kind of the way that voting has been in Congress on packages for support for Ukraine, there has been very strong bipartisan support. So I, my hope is that that will continue after the midterm elections. Um, I think there some Republicans could be more in, emboldened after. And so I think to Jeremy's point about this desire to get the Europeans to do more, to pay more, to, you know, to bring on more of the burden, that would be a return to a lot of the talking points that we certainly heard under the Trump administration. And so I don't think it's implausible that that would um, kick up after midterms. But that said, again, I think um, I, I, I continue to believe that this is really an area of strong bipartisan consensus and that for the foreseeable future, we will continue to work productively with allies in supporting Ukraine. I hope that's not wishful thinking, but um, but but that's my best guess of of where we're headed. Michael, what is what is your political sense? And in addition, about military burden sharing. In which areas you would realistically expect Europeans to do more? Because I, I think we can accept it as a fact that US um, capabilities to help Ukraine are just immensely bigger than, than those of, of, of Europe. Um, so that burden sharing can, can hardly be equal. And I don't... To be fair, I don't think anyone in Biden administration has even been demanding that so far. But but in theory, what what could one do more? Michael. Okay. Well, my political sense is not to talk about politics in DC. 
I do professional military analysis. I do not do domestic political analysis. Uh, stay away from that as much as I can. Um, on capabilities and burden sharing, so the issues are really material. Uh, the first is that European militaries don't have much depth, and they've already contributed a fair deal. And now they will have to make hard choices about what else they're willing to give Ukraine. They can contribute in the sense of training and other things, but when it comes to ammunition, when it comes to equipment, uh, their stockpiles are low and their production capacity isn't very good at all. On the U.S. side, yes, the United States has considerable more depth to its arsenal. It's a much bigger military and has much larger stocks. But the administration has already conducted a very large number of strategic drawdowns, and it's not a bottomless stockpile either. The U.S. also actually, while much being in much better shape in terms of production of ammunition, uh, does not produce it at a rate that would make this kind of expenditure in a large conventional war sustainable. Nobody does, to be perfectly honest. That's the thing about large conventional wars. They deplete stockpiles much faster than you can possibly replenish them. So there are long-term challenges in sustainability. They can all be addressed. The administration, uh, starting, I think, around late summer, began to work on funding to send clear signals to industry to increase production because industry needs to understand that it will benefit from funding on a multi-year timeline, right? The industry is not going to expand uh, production lines. It won't increase output of ammunition based on a war that could end at any point, okay? Uh, for them, they need to understand that somebody is going to be actually buying things from them three years from now, four years from now, five years, and what have you. So in that respect, I think the administration really started addressing this aspect of the challenge later into the summer to increase production output. Europeans need to do the same. So in, in important areas, Europe will take quite a few years just to replenish its own stockpiles based on what they've already given to Ukraine in the first six, seven months of the war. The war is actually far from over. And these are all conversations to be had about the medium and long term. That's why I said, have to be very careful with getting complacent, understanding that ammunition will be a continued issue, preparing equipment, providing additional equipment if the war goes on, right, if it's extended. And there's also long-term replenishment issues. I, I'm not involved in kind of the burden sharing. I don't think that's the issue. The issue is that people need to spend money to do more, and they need to be investing now, understanding if the war goes on, these sustainability issues are all going to come to the fore. Um, and, you know, as always, I mean, Kadri, you know my views on the subject because I, I, I was sitting right next to you at the Helsinki Security Forum when I said it, which is that this war teaches very valuable lessons about the capacity of European countries to potentially manage their own security in Europe without the United States in a leading and integrating role and what the future holds for that. All right. So I've certainly drawn my own conclusions on that subject. Yeah, that is that is very true. And uh, everyone in Europe, I think, is acutely aware of, of that as, as well. Uh, audience, you uh, are welcome to send us uh, questions. Um, <clears throat> uh, aha, there is one. Um, Actually, even even two questions. Um, uh, I will ask the first one from Michael, and then uh, another one, slightly rephrase and target to Andrea. Michael, question is: When will Belarus uh, join the fray in formal military capacity? And what I mean, you probably don't know when. I don't think Lukashenko has necessarily briefed you on that, but uh, you can tell us what the effect of that would be. It probably won't, because it's the one thing that will really endanger Lukashenko's regime. And Belarus has very little to contribute in a formal military capacity to this war. Belarus, though, is a material party to the war. And what they are providing Russia with is ammunition and equipment beyond the use of their own territory from which to conduct strikes on Ukraine. But the, the danger and threat of Belarus somehow getting involved, right, 
or the potential that Russia might deploy military forces back into Belarus in substantial quantities. They're going to have, a, I think, probably a permanent presence there, but it's quite, quite small. We'll probably still weigh on Ukrainian mines. That is, it'll pin some percentage of Ukrainian forces in the north just to make sure they're able to defend against the vector of attack from Belarus. So in that regard, it also serves Russian purposes. But I don't see Belarus as entering into this war as likely, both for political, but also for very practical military reasons. It won't do much of anything. Uh, instead, Belarus is essentially a pipeline of material support to the Russian military. Right, thanks. And another question is about um, winter. I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure. Um, probably the question is also about battlefield developments over the winter. But um, given that we are talking about Biden, actually, in my mind, it activated a different question. But I have been interested um, ever since same time last year when the whole diplomatic debate uh, with Russia started. Um, and Andrea, actually, I, uh, I was wondering now, so a year later, um, what do we know about the nature of the contacts back at that time? I mean, months leading up to February between US and, 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 and Russians, um, because it was evident already back then that actually Biden offered uh, Russians to discuss European security in terms that were different from those that had been offered before. And I, I think actually many things that were on President Putin's wish list would have been available. I mean, de facto changed security order, arms controls, talks, uh, neutrality of Ukraine, I think, uh, was was perfectly available. There was slight debate who should say it out aloud first. Um, what was not available, of course, was dismemberment of Ukraine. Uh, and that was what Putin chose to prioritize by, by going to war. Um, but have you been in Washington, uh, heard more about the nature of the contacts in those months, was there ever a chance of um, handling the issue in a peaceful manner? I guess I'm wondering if, if Putin was sort of, to the extent we can tell, was he set to start a war uh, always and was the whole diplomatic thing uh, just staged uh, a spectacle or, or whether some turns were things could have happened differently. What to pick up? Um, so the answer is we don't know, right? We don't know exactly if Putin was, you know, intent on doing this and this was a long plan. My sense, my best sense is that he was intent on doing this and all, all of the kind of diplomatic theater that played out in those summer months um, was intended to buy time for Russia to build the force that they thought they needed on the border. Um, and I also think it was intended, again, to buy time, but to keep the Europeans divided. So, right, but, but as you said, Kadri, there were a lot of disagreements and debates about whether or not this is the time to be calling Putin and talking with him and having these discussions or, or not. And so I think that, you know, all of the diplomacy that we saw both between the United States and Russia, but also Russia and the OSCE and with the EU, I mean, there were multiple channels of dialogue and discussion with a lot of very um, earnest and forward leaning offers, as you said. I mean, uh, leading up into this war, kind of the, the strategic stability dialogue with Russia was the primary kind of focus of U.S.-Russia relations. And I think there was a sense um, in that group and with especially with the cyber dialogue that a lot of productive um, discussions were being had um, in those fora. And so then when, as Putin is building his troops up on the border, there was an obvious kind of push to go back and make offers um, to build on some of the progress that I think the Biden administration thought that they were maybe having with Moscow. Remember, like the, the kind of key was to have guardrails on the relationship and the sense that was that the strategic stability and the cyber dialogues were a really were key to doing that. 
Um, so yes, I think from, from Washington's perspective, um, they leaned as far forward as possible as and, and putting legitimate items on the table that they thought we could discuss with Russia without compromising on our interests or Ukraine's interests. So from Washington's perspective, I think that door was definitely open. Um, so to me, it was clear that Putin had no interest in that dialogue. You know, he was sending negotiators that clearly were not uh, emboldened or empowered to actually have genuine discussions at the table. So to me, my best sense is that um, it that Putin was intent on taking these steps to invade Ukraine and that the diplomacy was a, a, a ploy to buy time and to keep the Europeans divided and from doing anything that could be conceived as escalatory, right? So in those months, no one wanted to provide additional weapons to Ukraine. We didn't want to preemptively uh, implement sanctions because the risk then was that you could push Putin across the threshold to do something more escalatory. So I think it was just really a, a diplomatic ploy to buy the time that they needed to prepare um, to do what they ultimately did. Yeah, I didn't view it as such at the time, but in retrospect, I I, I feel that you are you are right. Um, I've got a few questions here. I think the next one probably I should address to Michael. Um, an attempt to understand the Kremlin's way of thinking. Um, do they have a perception that if they massively use nuclear weapons in Ukraine and at the same time put the strategic weapons on, on alert or even conduct a death strike, uh, but then no one would retaliate? Um, so is, is that the case? I mean, do you think, uh, do you think that is the... That's the way the Kremlin thinking thinks, and does that shape that strategy, or um, or do we not know? Okay, so the question is: They think if they massively use nuclear weapons in Ukraine, then no one would retaliate. No, I don't think anybody thinks that. Um, I don't think anybody knows for sure what will happen if they use even one nuclear weapon in Ukraine. Probably they expect some kind of retaliation. So, but I don't yeah. know what the Kremlin thinks. Yeah, I'll be honest. Here's a big problem. It, it's not a question of, uh, it's the wrong, but to be very honest, I, I don't think this is the best way to think about the subject. The question isn't, what does the Kremlin anticipate? The Kremlin, the question is, are the, the threats that have likely been made seen as credible? And the second one is, would they deter Moscow? Right. And on there, I have two, I'm of two minds. Right. The first one is they may be credible, but the second is if Russian leadership is in a position where they seriously contemplate use of nuclear weapons, they're not likely to deter. In some way, I would say that I think much of what the administration did in the run up to the war were all very much the right things to do. But I didn't think they were going to deter Putin from invading Ukraine. I had written extensively that I thought this was an overdetermined outcome. And uh, very much thought along the lines that Andre just laid out now, that there wasn't really a serious diplomatic negotiation. Okay, um, so that's the way I, that's the way I think about it, that. You you can cer certainly do a lot to try, but I don't think they're necessarily going to prove to be credible deterrents. Right. There is right next question to you. Uh, what is your opinion of Russia's mobilization and military disinformation? Is it a weakness when a country forces people to join the military? I mean, we could say that mobilization is is not very enthusiastic, but uh, but does it have to be? It's happening nonetheless. I mean, it's compulsory by definition as a process and course of a nature. That's what mobilization typically is. So. Um, my opinion of it is it looks like a hot mess, certainly in these last couple of weeks, and that they're trying to mobilize a lot more people than the system can absorb early on. That because it's a tiered process, which involves a lot of civil regional administrations doing the legwork, it's ended up being in practice uh, like more of a phased general mobilization than the partial mobilization of people who meet the right military criteria. And there are a lot of challenges in that system. 
they've also clearly overwhelmed it, which has forced them to delay the October draft because we can clearly see that they can't process the 120,000 conscript rotation that they typically carry out um, in this time period. Uh, at the same time as they're trying to work through mobilization. It's essentially jammed up the system. Okay. Uh, that's my initial impression of it. And it's very, very variegated in the sense that it's going region by region, where some people have no training, some people get some training, some people get equipment, other people have to buy their own. In other cases, the regions have to dig into what's left of the rainy funds to equip these soldiers. So it seems like a pretty big mix across Russia as to what's happening. Um, that's that's also my view of it. Okay. But I think the question people are asking, like, what does it mean? And the answer is we don't know right now. Get comfortable with uncertainty. Okay. This is the world of contingency in military affairs. Right. It'll take time to shake out what it really means. I also, I mean, the, the, the thing that like just weighs really heavily is, I mean, I think Mike is alluding to this in some ways, but his point about the U.S. inability to deter nuclear use is right. And if at the end of the day, Putin feels judges that because either his life is on the line or for whatever rationale he uses, that he calculates that he needs to use a tactical nuclear weapon in Ukraine, I don't think that there's any amount of communication, threats, preemptive warnings um, that the United States or international countries could really do to change his calculus. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try. And just like, as Mike said, like we weren't going to deter the invasion of Ukraine. You know, if we had preemptively given sanctions and other things, I don't think that uh, given at the point at which we became worried about it, it was too late to deter at that point. Um, so yes, it, the United States is trying to do everything it can in order to deter the use. So we've already talked about the direct communications to the Kremlin, warnings about how the United States would respond, probably in relatively vague terms. There's a lot of dialogue now about can we recruit a broad coalition of countries to make statements preemptively condemning the use of nuclear weapons, right? We just have the G7 statement, but could we recruit countries like India, China, perhaps that could also communicate to the Kremlin how they would respond to nuclear use? Um, certainly there would be efforts by the U.S. intelligence community to declassify any sort of intelligence or information that indicated Russia was moving towards the nuclear use of a nuclear weapon. So we will try but I guess what I worry about is if Putin judges and we get to that point where he feels like he has no other options, I'm not sure there's much that the United States, Ukraine or the West can really do about it. Like you, you hear from Ukrainians, they're not deterred by the nuclear saber rattling. They are, you know, resolve and resolute to say that um, Putin's use of a nuclear weapon is not going to change how they fight the war. It won't change the outcome of the war. It just increases the cost that they have to incur to win the war. So I, I, it's, I don't, it's this, uh, it's this very uncomfortable place that we are that where I, you know, I think that the United States and certainly many of um, Ukraine's backers are resolute to stay the course, to not back down in the face of the nuclear saber rattling. And we may end up at a place where President Putin judges he has no other option but to use a nuclear weapon. And I don't know that there's all that much more that we can actually do about it. And I think that's, that, that's what weighs really heavily on me. Yeah, there is another question to you specifically, Andrea. Uh, short, easy question. Can Biden help Ukraine to win the war? Well, in fairness, we have been discussing exactly that uh, much of the evening. So um, you don't have to say anything, but if, if there is anything you want uh yeah, I mean, it's just to emphasize, I mean, certainly through the provision of military aid, financial aid, humanitarian aid, there's also a lot of sharing of intelligence and other uh, to help Ukraine with targeting and other things. So the United States has been really um, very actively involved. And as we've talked about, its support has evolved over time to provide ever more support to Ukraine, I think, in response to what Ukraine needs on the battlefield. Yeah. Would the United States do more? Certainly. And there's a lot of folks in Washington, D.C. who are pushing and calling to do more, whether it's to send the longer range attack them, more tanks, more air defense. But the, the Biden administration is moving in that direction. After the attacks on the civilian centers, we are moving forward and there are promises to provide air defenses. 
So the support is evolving, but I and, but I do think it's fair to say, yes, the United States probably could do more in terms of what they are providing with the Ukrainians. Um, I think there's a little bit of a fear. And again, it's balancing supporting Ukraine and positioning them to win the war with balancing that against the imperative to avoid a direct military confrontation with Russia. Some people would argue that the Biden administration has not got that balance right, that we could have been more forward leaning. But I think that's something that can, reasonable people can debate. So again, I think it's just really to stay the course, um, to not back down to the nuclear saber rattling, to demonstrate that we aren't going to change our behavior. We aren't going to walk back support just because Putin raises the nuclear flag. I think so, so that's what the United States can do. And and, and, and I guess the, the thing we have been emphasizing in this conversation is kind of the military picture and what's happening on the battlefield. There's also a huge economic component to this, which is huge. And right again, I think in my mind, I think Putin has shifted towards this strategy of trying to draw the war out with mobilization. And now it is, I think, part of his strategy is the economic strangulation of Ukraine. The Black Sea is still blockaded. There are no flights going into Ukraine. They're attacking critical infrastructure. I mean, they're they're devastating the Ukrainian economy. The, the amount of support, financial support, just to keep the Ukrainian economy afloat is massive. Um, and so there's that piece of it, too. So the United States and European backers could certainly be doing more to provide more and more consistent support to Ukraine on the financial front as well. Um, and we'll probably have to start thinking about measures to try to help Ukraine's economy um, get back on track, um, because that is also a critical piece of the warfare that Putin is waging in Ukraine. Yeah, now you have answered another question as well, was exactly, could the US do more? Um, there are two questions that actually I'm happy to take as um, from European perspective. Some in the EU are pursuing a European collective defense initiative that would exclude the US. Is this concept realistic and could such an institution disrupt NATO revitalization, investment, procurement, et cetera? No, I don't think so. I mean, given what's happening in Ukraine, I don't think no European um, Versailles mind would, would think of anything like that. Uh, connection to the US, NATO alliance are more important for Europeans than they have been for a long time. And all talk about so strategic autonomy, which we often fail to define and many people define it their own ways. But even so, I think, the basic idea of that is to make Europe better equipped to discuss security together with the US, uh, to, to have strategic thinking, to really have input into discussions and to have military capabilities to, um, to do its, 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 its fair share. So um, the smart minds in Europe, at least the ones that I talk, they never see these initiatives as, uh, instead of NATO, they would be seen as complementary to NATO or something that makes NATO stronger. And will transatlantic unity last? Um, I think so. I, I, I think up until 2024, certainly. And then we have a US election and, and then we will see what happens. Uh, US election is something that many people in Europe worry about. And that's probably the biggest danger to uh, transatlantic unity. Um, Michael, I saw you moving your hand. Was it that you wanted to add something? There is a question to you as well. Should we should we expect ripple effects from uh, from the war? What happens if it won't stay in Ukraine? Where could it go and how? I mean, by ripple effects, there are tremendous ripple effects from the war on the global economy, on the economic situation in Europe, there are humanitarian effects, there are refugees and IDPs, there are impacts on grain supply, as many people are aware, coming out of Ukraine. Uh, there are all sorts of effects, and there are things that haven't happened yet, you bet. Uh, where are potential horizontal escalation outside the region? Well, into a not a direct Russian-NATO conflict, but in forms of escalation between Russia and uh, leading Western states, 
supportive of Ukraine that have yet to take place. Um, it's important, uh, and I spoke about this actually early on about all the forms that escalation could take place beyond sort of just a direct conventional conflict between Russia and NATO. So yeah, there's still that, that potential, and that potential, of course, can go on as uh, the war uh, the war extends. That is, the the more mobilization extends the war. Well, Andrea spoke to you know Putin's main bet right now is that he can drag the war out beyond economic sustainability. If not for Ukraine, then perhaps for uh, Ukraine's uh, Western allies. And the issue being that hey, his bet that political support wouldn't last was proven wrong, right? So quite likely, and this is just one one kind of analyst opinion, like hypothesis, it's quite likely the bet he is making is that political support will remain, but the material capacity to continue supporting Ukraine over time won't be there. And, and that psychology is, is somewhat derivative of the fact that people who think that they're in charge of a great power believe that they have tremendous amount of latent power and resilience. That is, that they have a huge amount of endurance and that the question is one fundamentally of political resolve, of the will to drag the war on and see it through. You know, one of the things that's challenging about wars is that it's often incumbent upon the losing side to decide when the war is actually over, right? And Putin's definitely indicated that he can drag this on and not concede defeat for quite some time. But, of course, the challenge is, you know, political leaders typically often typically reason by analogy. And usually when they reason by historical analogy, they won strip away a lot of the context from those historical analogies and use the bits they like. And two, often like the analogies that that serve their preferences. So somebody like Putin might well be looking through all the cases where Russia proved resilient and was able to overcome over time, instead of looking historically to all the wars Russia lost because of disastrous political leadership and bad mistakes and poor military performance. Because there's a lot of those in Russian history too, right? And this war has, you know, an interesting combination of like Russian military performance akin to the Russo Japanese War with Russian strategic decision making more akin to the Crimean War in some respects. As I'm, I'm making also, you know, say all analogies are, are imperfect, but some are useful. I too am making some very imperfect analogies. Mm. Um, yeah. And, nice. and I fully agree with what you said, by the way, in European security. And, and is collective European security possible uh, the way people are talking about? It? Uh, no. Would it be disruptive to NATO and the security that's currently in Europe? Yes. This war clearly shows the European militaries uh, all together do not combine into the capacity to project military power in Europe at scale. The United States needs to be involved in a leading role in European security and as the main integrating military power. OK, but I, I sometimes hate the sound of that, because what I always want to say is that Europeans should aspire to this ability, right? And they should aspire to the kind of unity and the military uh, capability to, and more importantly, capacity to be able to do this. Sure. But they need to understand and practice how far away they are from it, right? And not to get into this wishful thinking that because we overestimate Russian military capability or more specifically performance in this war right now in the year of 2022, that suddenly they can handle European security on their own or manage the Russia problems and moving forward. Mm -mm. This is this is magical thinking in my view. And keep in mind that, hey, Russia goes through cycles of resurgence, stagnation, and decline. It still has a considerable capacity for reconstitution. And the question of Russia rebuilding military capacity is not a question of if. It's just a debate about when and what timeline depending on what happens in this war and the impact of sanctions and export controls, right? But that's the real question. And so people should be very sober-minded about that aspect of it too. Absolutely. Our time is soon over. Um, I won't take any more questions from the audience. I have my own uh, last two questions to the two of you. Uh, Andrea, I want to ask you about uh, China. I mean, um, um, when we first, I think, met at ECFR seminar, I asked you to talk about Russia, China and US view on, on that. Um, and for a long time, I mean, China was seen as the bigger 
the, the true challenge. And that's why Biden wanted to stabilize relationship with Russia and to put those guardrails in order to be able to focus on, on China. Now, Russia's war has taken away much of attention, but China has not disappeared. China, China is still there. So how 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 are these two things um, connected today? Um, I was actually also struck when I talked with a China Watch colleague. Um, it seemed that for her, the Ukraine war looks like a proxy war, but not between America and Russia, the way they talk about it in Moscow. They view Ukraine as America's proxy and Russia as an independent power. Um, for my China specialist colleague, it was clear that it's going to be a proxy war between China and, and the US. And Russia being China's proxy by virtue of China, of, of Russia's economic resilience being now so dependent on some lifelines that China can give it in terms of technology transfers, et cetera. How, I mean, unlikely the sort of true military involvement, but in many aspects where uh, Western sanctions uh, constrain Russia's capacity to act, China has stepped in. So how is that? conundrum now seen in Washington? Well, the national security strategy is about to be released. I think I have an embargoed copy in my inbox right now that I have not read. And I'm sure it will answer that question. Um, my sense is, I mean, again, everyone's, I think, in Washington is still focused on China as the pacing challenge. That is the most significant, most comprehensive threat that the United States faces over the long term. But I think there is broad consensus that the immediate threat right now is Russia in Ukraine. Um, and there is broad consensus, even among China watchers, that we have to deal adequately with this threat. And there's a lot of people who would see the challenges as related that if we don't defeat Russia in Ukraine, that it sends all sorts of unproductive and unwanted message messages to Xi Jinping um, and our resolve to push back on revisionist authoritarian actors. So even though um, everyone, I think, still very much believes that China is the pacing challenge, I don't, I, I'm not seeing as much as I actually expected of the kind of tug of war on resources or other things there are, of course, some voices in Washington who are loudly advocating that, you know, we have to not stay focused on China and like, as Mike was saying, you know, shift the problem to the Europeans to deal with Russia, that those arguments are being made, but they don't, they are not predominant and they are not the consensus view inside Washington. Um, so I don't know, but let's stay tuned for the national security strategy because the, it will be answered here um, today, I think is the, is the big public release of the NSS. Yeah, good shout out. And Michael, I think I want to give last word to you and to, um, to give us some ideas about the future. Um, what will Russia's place in European security be in the future? I mean, we, we tend to think about it in a fairly binary way these days. I mean, there are many who demand that Russia needs to suffer a strategic defeat. It needs to go through uh, atonement uh, the way Germany did. It needs to really uh, profoundly change its mind about its behavior. Or alternatively, if Russia wins, uh, then thinking goes, Russia will keep collecting territories, then other countries will fall next. Um, but these are not the only options, are, are they? I know you have done some thinking on, on that question. Yeah, I mean, look, I don't have the answer for what the future holds, but here's kind of my view of it. There, there are two long-term interrelated challenges from when thinking about Russia and the question of European security, at least this is my perspective. Maybe not just two, I'm being a bit reductionist, but two things I think we should focus on. So the first one is Russia is going to be an influence on European security, just a question of what kind. Um, and the, the first fundamental issue is that Russia is not a stakeholder in European security. So the main military power on the continent outside of NATO uh, is a country that is revisionist, right, uh, and not a stakeholder in European security. This is just a long-term problem. 
right? The second one that's interrelated with that is a still ongoing fragmentation of the Soviet Union, because a lot of these are principally wars of Soviet succession, right? The sense that the Soviet Union is dead, but it's not gone. And the reality that, you know, some of the very smaller conflicts of the 1990s, perhaps were the first generation of these wars, but the, the following generations have been much growingly larger and larger conventional wars, right? That's principally an imperial war. And... I think from, from the Russian point of view, this war was meant to be not just one of kind of imperialistic conquest, but also one that was supposed to relitigate re the post-Cold War order in Europe, that is Russia's position in the European security order, because what Moscow ultimately wants is to, I mean, from my point of view is that they very much wanted to uh, uh, force a security order where Russia has a vote over security outcomes and security arrangements and how things are decided. Nobody's going to, you know, no one's going to agree with it. And they've, they've lost dramatically, actually, in both counts, right? They've uh, they failed in this um, fairly disastrous imperial war. And however it turns out, uh, the one thing that they definitely managed to achieve is to lock Russia out of any serious conversations on its role in European security for a long time. Certainly, at least as long as the near Putin's in power, right? Like Russia and European security will be a challenge and a problem to be dealt with, not a serious interlocutor on European security after this. At least that's my view of it. That's obviously not forever, but this is the reality. I mean, what kind of conversations do you expect to take place? Uh, with Vladimir Putin moving forward. All right. So in many ways, this was, I think, given, given the aims of Russian political elites, this is a strategic debacle. But that doesn't answer the big long-term questions. I think Andrea spoke to these earlier in the conversation, which is, look, Russia's going to have a role and is going to be an influence in Europe and in European security of some kind. It can be incredibly negative. It can be difficult, but you know you could have a more stable relationship down the line, right? Or the more optimistic case, which is Russia's not immutable. Yes, Putin may be replaced by another authoritarian leader. Sure, I fully, fully agree with that. Uh, but at the end of the day, Russia's not immutable. At some point, you can't have a Russia as a stakeholder in European security. It has been in the past in prior European security orders, right? Uh, so... Um, and I'm very far from one of those people that's overly optimistic about these questions, but just saying that you need to have some kind of goals that you're working towards rather than throwing your hands up and just saying, this can't change, it's too hard, so we should just do nothing, right? The costs of doing nothing are also quite high. They're actually very visible in some respects over the past year. Yeah, and on the last point, totally agree with Andrea on, on the balance. I think, yes, defense community wants to focus more on China, for sure, that's where their preference lies. I don't think that we're going to seriously walk away from those believing that European security can just be handed over to the Europeans. Uh, I think there will be an interim period where people are all going to say that Russia is four foot tall militarily and we don't have to worry about it as much. That's true. Um, but that that too shall pass. That too shall pass. Uh, Audrey, I was just looking at the fact sheet from the National Security Strategy. This is the line. Uh, we will effectively compete with the PRC, which is the only competitor with both the intent and increasingly the capability to reshape the international order while constraining a dangerous Russia. So I think that's still still where the administration is. That gives you the right emphasis. Indeed. Uh, among the things that pass um, is our time. Uh, it's over. Uh, we need to close here. It's been fantastic conversation. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, uh, Michael, for inviting me. Uh, Montre Institute and Carnegie Corporation has been a great pleasure.